chart here. I have the initial design sketched out on my canvas here, and I'll try to uh, pick this up the best I can since it is on a white surface with just a really subtle pencil line. But the point is here that when you work on canvas and you start tracing things out, you want to make sure that you don't push too hard with the pencil uh, because as you come in with either opaque or transparent colors, this may be hard uh, to get rid of later on down the road. So I've sketched this out and I'm going to come in right now and uh, start doing my uh, sequential masking. I definitely have my canvas uh, primered with gesso. I tend to like Krylon spray gesso just because it lays on really evenly and smooth. And I've taken some uh, really generic uh, masking tape at Walmart. Get the $2 roll that's basically uh, somewhat transparent that's actually going to come in handy when you're doing masking on the canvas here. You don't want a lot of bleeding problems as you go along here. So. What I'm going to try to teach here when you're masking on canvas is basically that you need to put your first strip down like so. You can see that the pencil lines actually show through. Okay, let's go on to the next step here. Now I have all of this skull taped off. Probably took me a good 40 to 45 minutes. Um, but what you want to do after you expose the masking tape, you want to take some Goo Gone uh, and a blue Walmart shop towel and wipe all the adherence and the glue. Uh, that was left on there, all the residue and so on. After that, hit it with a uh, blow dryer, medium fan, low heat, and it will uh, actually evaporate the goo gone, and then you can go ahead and start base coating and doing your colors. Uh, the reason I went through all this is to actually um, achieve some edge acuity as opposed to just doing it freehand. If you do it freehand, it's going to look more animated. And if you do it this way, um, I'm going to have this edge acuity that I will be able to go up against this tape and do some other things with blowing and wisping uh, concepts here. So uh, not only that, but if this skull actually cracked and was going that way, um, it would have uh, acute edges uh, for the most part. You don't have to make them real um, uh, crisp like this. You can actually go in and soften them up with electric erasers and so on, but this just gives me a good nice composition and balance to all the softness and blowing and wisping stuff that's going to be going on through the center of the skull. So let's go ahead and go on to the colors in the next step here. I'm going to presuppose the lightning's hottest point is going to be over in this area that I actually start about right in here on the edge of the uh, canvas. So with my airbrush I'm going to actually angle this in from the side uh, to start setting this up. And again the stuff is still covered up. I can actually use this mask uh, to my advantage to test my flow and uh, you still want to be careful and spray lightly and evenly. Now this is actually just to set up the light. I'm going to come in with a paintbrush and actually refine the inside of this fuzzy uh, t-shirt looking uh, lightning bolt here. Uh, and again it's fine if you're working in production but if you're doing illustrating and so on you want to try to set it up like this and then go in with a paintbrush and then tighten that up uh, in the center. So I'll go ahead and continue and start fogging this out. Let the paint catch up with the surface when you're doing something like this too. Now I'm holding my airbrush at an angle for the purposes of uh, teaching but normally you want to make sure your airbrush is straight on. Zooming in, you can see, hopefully on camera, there's still some tape right in here. Okay, the next step here is I'm going to take this clear contact paper and mask around the perimeter of the skull here. Cut inside of the area that you've painted so you will not have this annoying white edge uh, that a lot of people really really notice quickly uh, whether you do car graphics or whatever. Uh, but clear contact paper, it's normally 
anywhere from $5.80 to $6 at um, your local store. And make sure that you try different types of this clear contact paper because there's different adherence levels on whatever type you buy. So what I'm going to do now is go ahead and start shading this skull, talk about color, dimension, and start sneaking in these freehand shields here. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is take some Createx White, put some of my airbrush there, and some of this chocolate color here. This, these are both acrylics. And all I'm looking to do is just try to give a light, faint indication that this skull is a little bit old. I've been sitting around somewhere. Uh, white's going to be way too dominant for something like this. So I'm going to go ahead and tint the whole skull down a really kind of, I don't know, like an eggshell brown. Make sure you watch your overspray if it crawls. Almost like an amber, ochre, brown type color here. And this basically will just offset the uh, tone of the skull to where it's not real, real dominant. Skulls are not really a loud white type color. It's kind of an eggshell type tone. So I'll go ahead and really lightly dust this color. So I have an opaque base here to work with. So lightly dust this on and we'll go to our next color here. Next I'm going to come in with that same white and add just one drop of black. Stir this up. And skulls also have a gray hue. I'm working primarily in opaque tones. Anything in nature, as you see uh, cobblestone or wood grain or whatever, has a really dusty gray base to it. So, a little bit of gray here. I think I'll go one more drop of black on this. So it shows up a little bit better. Skulls, the way I look at them, have amber type tones, gray type of tones. You may see some green, subtle hints of green. And you'll even see some blue, depending on uh, how the light is hitting it. These are all just base values for this that are going to help me later on. And the next thing I'm going to do is come in here. I have about 30 drops of black with three drops of white. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to start sketching very lightly. And one of the things that I want people to start realizing is that you'll gain more control when you airbrush by actually working really, really, and I hate saying the word watery, but really, really light to dark. Control with an airbrush is learned from working bigger to smaller and lighter to darker. And if you could actually see the uh, gray that's in this color cap here, um, it's very, very light, but it's actually saturated to a very dark intensity. So um, I'm going to come in here, and the secret to airbrushing, in my opinion, or a good way to think about gaining control when you're working really intricately, is to do little wisps like that. Just little tiny wisps. You can call it what you want, but just practice off to the side before you jeopardize the surface. And I'm going to do that stroke more than anything else I do. So this is a basic foundation on how to think about shading as you're crawling along here is that you're going to have to sketch first. So that actually is a dagger stroke. Just like that. So I'm going to come in here and not be totally dependent on uh, shields or templates or any of that type of stuff, but I'll sneak in whatever I need to sneak in to achieve the desired result and effect here. And if you zoom out, you'll see how i got some real light tones on there. Fade out. Now there's a shadow in this area here that I'm going to set up. When you're shading things, I have a four square system that I've taught in other videos which basically says that something is either a totally dark square or it's half that intensity, which is a half tone, or it's half of a half tone, which is a quarter tone, 
or it's totally zero, the white voided type areas here. That's how I'm thinking to myself as I'm shading something like this. Now, the mask is actually keeping this relatively crisp as I'm crawling along here, but if it looks too much like I cut out a piece of uh, a paper skull and glued it on a um, blue background, that's not what I'm looking for. So I'm actually, or I could come in with an electric eraser and soften up some of these edges on the perimeter if I need to. Okay, next I'm going to sneak in a freehand template. You can use whichever one you want. You can make your own. Um, I'm going to sneak a freehand template in on the socket of where this eye was. And one of the biggest misconceptions about templates is number one, people call them stencils. They're not stencils. Um, a stencil pretty much serves one isolated purpose. Um, like a leaf or something like that. But a template actually is universal in its application. This eye socket that I'm carving out here actually like this and I can put my knuckles underneath this template if I need to. Um, this could also be used for some type of a jawline if I'm doing a portrait or something. Um, this section right here could be Winnie the Pooh's toes and so on and so on. So if it has a weird shape that really doesn't make sense, then it's universal in its application. I'm going to come in with a different template now, and I made this one myself. You can make them whatever kind of shape you want. So um, again, you can use uh, Hallmark greeting cards for edges if you want to. Here's a little edge right here I want to nail down and again I'm going to work really soft on this that's the edge and even though I'm achieving an edge here like this I can actually this is where I started I can actually roll this out and wisp it out like that taper it off again trying to stay true to my photo reference this starts taking shape when you get up to this part of the skull here, near the cranium. And I can also split what I call splitting edges, like so. I think I'll use this part of it right here. But look, I'm actually putting my knuckle or my fingers underneath this shield. It gives me a softer type tone that I can fade out. There's some shading down here. The cool thing about calming your colors down with white um, or gray is that it actually gives you more chances and helps you control the saturation of the paint to the surface. If you want something to look really, really commercial, um, just go in and use a bunch of transparent paints and it's going to look uh, very cartoony, very animated. Because again, most things in nature, I don't care if it's rocks, trees, skulls, they have a lot of gray to their base, or grayish type of tones. So I'm going to continue coming in here. Uh, I don't want to oversaturate this edge right here, but I think I'm just going to give it some tone just to separate it from the background, but I do not want to separate this really, really dramatically. Just lightly. Maybe apply some heat there. and that should be enough for that area. Any paint that I don't like on here, I'm going to come in with an electric eraser and scratch it and highlight it, um, taking the paint off the surface. And definitely make sure that you lighten up on your pencil lines. Don't get too dramatic on those because they may be hard to hide later on. So uh, next what I'm going to do is come in here and start sculpting and shaping cheekbone here, a little dagger stroke very lightly, like so. I'm going to come down. There's actually a little cast shadow underneath there. And again, little wisps. Sometimes when you're uh, tracing or projecting or whatever you're doing, make sure you also reference shadows. Some people just reference the object. You definitely want to make sure you reference the shadows too, because if you get too carried away with the shadow, it's going to be really silly looking. You cannot lie with light a lot of the times. And I'll put a little bit of tone over in this area here.
Again, not too harsh, just a little bit. And if we back out, we can see it takes on pretty good form already without doing too much. Coming over here in this nose area, I think there's a couple ways you can do this. I can come in here with a shield like this and just isolate that area and roll it around. Or you could come in with a piece of paper, simple piece of uh, notebook paper, typing paper, whatever, and actually make it look more believable. Just make sure that when you come in with something like this, you let the paint, again, catch up with the surface. This makes it look a little bit more fragmented and believable. This is another thing that I use when I do knuckles or something like that. Sneak this down here at the bottom. Zoom in a little bit to show you how this really pops it out. This edge here is something you don't want to get too crisp with because if you do, trust me, it will negate the realism just like that. So I'm going to make sure my mask is pressed down here so I don't have any bleeding uh, around the edges here. I think I'll stop at this point. I can go ahead and pierce that out later if I need to. I will bounce around in my own nature just to uh, make sure I don't overwork a particular area because if I overwork a particular area then everything actually has to match that. So again, control with the airbrush is learned from working bigger to smaller and lighter to darker. Okay, we're going to focus on the teeth next here. Now keep in mind that since I'm trying to demonstrate this in a video I normally would not work this quick. So um, you can uh, do teeth however you want to do them but I'm going to take my base tone here and again these little strokes are little dagger strokes. As we pull out farther, they become feather strokes, but control is learned from this stroke. And if I would have been cryloning back and forth at this point, um, I may have a patch or a barbell somewhere around the perimeter of this tooth or these teeth. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sneak in my little template here. This uh, shield comes in handy for so many things, it's ridiculous. But um, the trick here is to not be too dependent on freehand. Uh, there are some excellent artists out there who can freehand every single thing. And if you give me the time to, to do the freehanding and the money, I will definitely put 10 or 15 hours into a piece and knock these teeth out. Um, if you don't have that time or you want something that's pretty uh, expeditious, um, you can come in with this type of a shield and just align this shield with the um, tooth that you're trying to nail down. In this case, uh, I guess I'll start over here on this one. And you can see that all these little humps provide the edge that you need. Now all I'm going to do with this is just establish the basic form of the tooth with this. Really just concentrating on this upper part of the tooth here. I can actually create an edge like this and then take and flip this shield around and finish this off lightly. Now I may have to go in and scratch highlights out in the teeth to make them believable but I'm going to preface my wash on where I'm going with this thing. Come in, do the next little edge here. Looking up at my photo reference constantly and I'm going to go to a different part of this shield now and this tooth right here is a little bit more pointy so now that one down I'm going to take and flip my shield here like so and you can actually see I'm starting to sculpt the form of the teeth here so um, that's all you do is just kind of roll this around to whatever works here's a smaller one here and the teeth are very random in nature anyway so this actually comes in handy Boom, got that one, finish it off, I can pierce it now a little bit, again I may have to take paint off later, and do them all like this. As long as you don't do what I call crisscrossing, when you're using an edge like this and you spray, that you don't cross into the next section, um, or in this case the next tooth, um, and these shields actually can be um, your little miracle that comes in handy when you just can't seem to get the free handy down. So 
I'm going to go along, finish these three up, go on to the next step here. I need to separate these. Hopefully you'll see quickly here that black is way too dominant for something like this. And you can be very random with teeth. Now I'm going to take that same shield and this is kind of cool. I'm actually going to trap these gum lines here. Make sure I don't reposition wet paint. But I'm actually going to take this shield and I think I'll do this one over here so people can see better. And really lightly give an indication that there's a gum line here. I'm not a dentist, I think that's what it's called, but that actually helps this look more believable and it will assist me in uh, giving uh, dimension. So I'm going to trap, what I call trapping, all these little gum line ridges really lightly. I do not need to go in and kill these things. Colors everything when you're doing stuff like this. Look at your picture as much as you can. I'm going to roll this along here. Got my pointy tooth there. And I'll come back to this area. And this is where People can say you're cheating by using stencils, but this proves that this is not a stencil. This is a template that serves many, many different purposes. I just feel like an old lady if someone says, are you using stencils or something like that. So it takes skill to use these things as you're crawling around different shapes and so on. So that actually traps the gum line, and I will come in later and take paint off the surface to make that look not so concise and not so crisp, and it will help me in composition. next area here where the uh, cheekbone is, I'm going to just make sure that I stay more true to form and shape. This thing just isn't a cheesy hump, it actually comes in and angulates like so. And it goes back a little bit. So I'm going to start doing some shield work here and knuckling my shield. Again, do not get too crisp. Keep your fingers underneath this thing. I can actually go in and feather some of this out, split some of it, split the shadow from the point of origin here, and come in. And this is why I like this Aztec, you can get a lot of detail. I think what I'll do is come in here and nail that down. Now that's the edge. This is actually going to be the wash that accompanies it. little wisps here. I will have a crack coming through here later on. And if I want to, I can even sneak this part of the shield in. To pierce that little edge out there. So you can see it takes some form on pretty quickly here. Try to get this centered and work in this area now, right in here. And moving on to the next element here of shading, I'm going to come in this bridge area of the nose. you got to stay true to your light source. Make sure you don't violate any area that does not need to be shaded. I'm not going for photorealism with this, but I'm definitely not going for a cheesy commercial look either. Now over here, at the top of the nose, I'm going to put a little bit of tone, um, again, just to split this from the background. I don't want to go in here and totally make this super dark because it will look really silly. Edges, and the best way to manipulate people's eyeballs with edges is to actually make them subtle. That's true with tulips on a white background. Uh, a lot of famous artists use that little trick, and it's a really good way to manipulate an effect. So. That's about all the shading I will do right there. Maybe blend it out a little bit and cusp up underneath this area here, the smidge. It's a good idea to take your finger and use it as a reference point when you're assigning value in shading. That's essentially what shading is. You're assigning value in certain areas of a certain part of whatever object you're painting. So. There's also some little nuances of shading down here. 
little wisps. Always go to the side and test your flow before you jeopardize the image. I'm going to go ahead and inside this nose bone, I'm going to split this area here. I think we'll zoom in a little bit so we can catch what I just did. Getting real, real close here. I'm going to split this area. Wipe the paint off the shield and then come in and split it right there. That presupposes that bone is protruding but was cracked or whatever. I'll come back later on and uh, touch that up with some more highlights. And I'm going to bring this shadow out a little bit, give it some curve. This is a high contrast skull, which is again very manipulative. The word is chiaroscuro. Um, Caravaggio was one of the famous artists that liked to work this way. But um, anytime you can get something like this that has really intense lighting, the realism is going to pop out pretty quickly. So I think that's enough in this area because I will be coming back and taking paint off. I got this area set up where it needs to be. I might go in and put one little line right in here. And we'll move on to the inside of the eye here. Okay, the inside of the eye, I'm going to set up all the little nuances and the things that are going on, the cracks, and so on. I do not need to come in with black at this point. This gray is still fine. And one thing I can do, just to bring this around a little bit, is go back to my shield and again, knuckle it. I'm probably going to say that a thousand times, I think, in this video. But here's the shape. It could start there. It rolls around. And I can knuckle or put my fingers underneath this thing just to presuppose a continuum of an edge. See where I'm at. Don't kill it. Work really light, see where you're at, and then go in later on and intensify it. <clears throat> but that at least establishes the basic socket that this eye falls into. And all I'm doing is sketching at this point. Nothing intense, not a lot of detail, just setting up the basic elements here. You want different levels of shading when you're crawling and jumping around. So we'll move on to this area up here now. Okay, moving on to this other area here underneath the uh, cranium as it bends under. I'm going to grab a shield with that same gray mixture and continue sculpting and not too crisp and sketching. And you'd be amazed on how these shields actually bend and help you carve these little shapes out. Now, I'm going to try to find the best angle for this. That's going to help me a little bit right there. Little wisps. And then finishing that off. Now I'm going to taper it. And this actually goes up. So see, it's one thing to think that Again, that these are cheesy stencils when they're not, but you know, it's one thing to use edges, but let's see you go in and shade it and see if you can pull it off. So it takes some skill and patience to be able to go in and nail all these little intricate indentions and areas where things protrude. Uh, here's a funky little crack right up in here. Again, this is just a guide where I'll come in later. I'm going to put some tone in there. This is the more round, cabbage-shaped part of the skull. And start fading some of this out. Again, a cabbage comes to mind, the shape of a cabbage. 
leaving the white area void to create the dimension. And the forehead area here. There's an indention in this area right here that I have noticed. Leaving this area void. I'm going to come in a little bit there. And put my knuckles under this, or your fingers. Just presuppose there's an edge there. I'm going to fade that out. And it actually bends up something like that. I don't want to get too extreme in that area. This is a little darker, I noticed. Up here, there's a little stripe going on there. You need to pay attention to. This is where the artistry comes in. You better have an airbrush where you don't get that pinky cramp. And all this up here is relatively muted gray also. This is pretty extreme at the top. Like going into this area at the tip of the skull, I can actually split little edges here. And make sure you curve when you're doing these. It actually gives it some dimension. It makes it look chipped. Be kind of random with that. Come in on the ear area here. There's a lot of weird stuff going on, shapes and edges. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start sketching. This prefaces where I'm going to put certain tones or washes or what have you. Make sure I know where I'm gonna lay these shields and start splitting edges and so on. This is an area that's kind of random looking, so you can actually speed it up quite a bit. You never want to get too dark too soon when you're doing stuff like this. A little bit closer here. Keep in mind with this Aztec, this is a high flow nozzle. I'm going to take this nozzle as far as I can take it. Just to prove sometimes that it's really not always the tip, but how you mix your paint. And the hypersensitivity of the trigger too. Now I have a little hump here that actually gives a nice little shadow there, a dimension. That's going to help me later on. I'm trying to keep my airbrush at an angle so everybody can see. This actually feathers out. To me, if someone tells me their airbrush gets a fine line to pi to infinity, it means nothing to me. It's one thing for an airbrush to get a fine line, but let's actually see you sculpt and shade with it. Then, I believe you have a good airbrush. I always have the rule that if your airbrush does not feel like a pencil, then you need to get one that does. Put some base tone back here towards the back. actually coming up right about there that I will refine with a paintbrush and scratch later on. This is all dark towards the bottom. Don't put too many cracks anywhere because it will really kill it. 
and make it not look as believable. Okay, next I have some opaque black here, but you really want to be careful with how much you use. Um, it's easy to get in and really kill this with black. The black's just going to be for the piercing areas, the little crisp areas. And my darkest area, I'm looking up here every two or three minutes. That actually helps transition the colors from the softness to the acute edge here. So we're going to sneak some of this in in different areas. Um, I'm being more dependent actually on the uh, gray base that I used earlier than I am on this. This is just to accentuate certain areas lightly without putting cheesy stripes and cheesy lines all over the place. This area here, I can put my fingers underneath this shield and get it. give an indication that that is an eye socket. Come in down here. Put my fingers underneath this thing. And see, so you just get a softer edge if you do that. I understand the complaint about using templates, but just put your fingers underneath them. They don't have to be as harsh. Now if I want to get really, really intense, I can spray right up against the shield, but you better not do that too many times or you might have uh, very Mr. Potato Head looking shapes all over the place. But I'll roll this around. I've learned from doing enough floral art that uh, really subduing edges is important in composition. You can see how that pops that off the surface. And with my paper just give it an indication. Don't need to kill it. An edge there. And if I don't like that, I can pop it out later on, but I think it looks uh, believable. Now, oddly enough, I'm actually going to stay off this edge here uh, just to retain some of the believability of the dimension. So, and come in with some free handing, and little intricate areas here. All right fade it out a little bit. You can come in with many different levels of black and gray. It's not a sacrilege. And I see I missed this little area down here. The more random the rip, the cooler you are. I'm going to be real careful in this area here. This is where it can start looking fake if I go too dominant on this edge. There's also going to be a little area there that I'll set up with the gray. I went like this. You can grab whatever you want as long as you do not crisscross edges into the perimeter of the shape. So in my other videos we'll get more into defining shapes and languages of the shield. Right, and start working this area here. Have my black still. And this paper could come in handy in weird little areas like right there just to break this up. You actually look at a bone over the ear starts. It's very much like a paper rip. And I might even continue this up.
Okay, so hopefully this uh, somewhat illustrates how we're working really light to really dark. There's actually a recession, a V-shaped recession in the skull here. I'm going to come in here with little wisps. Staying at an angle so you guys can see. One of the biggest problems that people have when they're shading um, is assigning what I call assigning value to different areas of different shapes. So if you just try to come in here with little wisps and not Krylon back and forth, you're going to actually uh, retain and develop more control. Again, I'm not going for a photographic look when I'm doing this, but I definitely do not want it to look cartoony and animated. I'm going to put my knuckle under the shield here. Once I start coming in with the electric eraser, it's really going to assist me in making the, uh, the bone texture believable. This just sets it all up. So a little crack right in here. So I'm going to nail down with the paintbrush. Again, this is the halo. You can be pretty random and dusty when you're setting that up there. So I'm going to continue shading around this eye socket. And then I will move upward towards where this actually starts to um, curve around um, near the top of the forehead here. And do a little bit of shading right over here. Okay, I'm going to come in with this Helix electric eraser, normally $8 to $10 at your local office store. A couple things about using these, when you come in here and start grinding off the paint, the preparation of the surface is very important. You really do have to have a very smooth, gessoed surface or it will not take off the paint uh, in a really soft, uh, blendy type of way. So, uh, the mistake that you may make, if you're not aware of this, is that you may try to paint right on canvas without any primer or gesso or anything and uh, end up trying to do this technique and you will have a very coarse um, 80 grit type of uh, pattern um, across whatever you're doing. So make sure the surface is really, really prepared um, and smooth or this will not be effective. Another thing is that when you're using this, make sure that uh, the weight of your hand isn't pressing down too hard. The more the battery dies on this thing, sometimes I think it comes in handier because it really gives you even more of a uh, softer um, scratch across the highlight here. So um, I will come in here and start taking the paint off. Now you don't want to put dots all over the place. If it starts to look too dotty, then what you do is come in, wipe the eraser off a little bit. Just come in a little bit lighter. Come in a little bit lighter here and break those up. Thank <laughs> you. 
Now with bone, get away with quite a bit because bone may have, or a skull may have, a very dotty type of granular type of pattern. But on a portrait or something like that, you really got to keep a very light pressure on the uh, electric eraser. So I will continue grinding these highlights here. And super, super, super light feathery pressure on this thing. And you can see the difference when you get real close of a more softer type of highlighting and then a more dotty type thing. So just by lightening up, I mean super light, you do not get as much of a dotty type of pattern. If you need dots and stippled type of highlights, um, this will definitely serve its purpose. But the gesso is going to allow us to blend some of these dots out and um, really, really make this uh, texture believable here. So, I, I've seen other people do this in the past and they've just kind of ripped in and out with this thing, but they really don't uh, cover the intensity of how you're supposed to hold this thing and really emphasize the amount of pressure you're supposed to put on it. I'm going to come in and start intensifying and piercing some of these shadows as they come around towards the top part of the forehead here. Little wisps. No cryloning. It's pretty dark up in this area. Now again, the original tape was really just to separate all this white from this intense dark color. You can actually freehand over this. And this does two things. Number one, it helps it roll around in its dimensional form here. And it uh, calms uh, the edge down from this looking like uh, a piece of paper cut out that was actually just spray glued on top of this. So you do not have to be totally dependent on just these edges. You can carve and roll them around to establish the dimension and the form of the object here. And here's a funky little area that will come in and nail down. Re-emphasize that. And as long as you're not criss-crossing edges, these shields uh, actually come in handy. And I'll get real close now. If I get too crisp, I can actually go back and fix it, lighten it up with an eraser or something. Okay, now I'm going to do what's called knuckling the shadow. I'm just going to lift the uh, template off the surface here and do little wisps until I get an indication that there's a shadow there and then taper that out. I'm going to move down to the teeth and make sure that I match this intensity for the most part without getting too carried away here. And there's a lot of weird stuff going on with the teeth here, a lot of free handing. You can jump around pretty nicely over here. I'm going to pierce this out a little bit more here. Sometimes it's a good idea to go in Xerox 
your photo references in many different contrasting forms. And it will help you establish which is too much and which isn't. I'm making decisions as I go along here. And the reason I'm setting this up first is because the teeth are going to be shaded right behind this thing. So I want to make sure that I'm actually crawling down the skull from the socket to this bridge of the cheek here to the teeth and kind of keep this continuity and keep everything uniform as I crawl down here. All this white line and this stuff can be free handed out later on. Teeth, for the most part, are not white. They're a very ochre looking tone. So what I'm going to do is put a light value of this charcoal type of color on the teeth so that most of the highlighting and the form of the teeth are going to be established by taking the paint off. So this is a mild dusting just to set these things up so that they will support the highlight with the electric eraser. You've got to have this dusting on here to pull the highlights off. I have a little strandy type of tone coming down here. Little wisps. This is, for the most part, pretty indented right here. It kind of sinks in. <laughs> Okay, next I'm going to come in here and pierce these out a little bit with the charcoal gray color. This is a good wrap around contrast to all the uh, loud scratching that I just did. And again, if it gets too grainy, you can dust back over it and then lighten up and then dust back over it and sequentially move along like that. And that helps pop out the dimension in the teeth and is a good contrasting element to this white scratching that I did. Art is really a rhythm of contrasting elements. I remember a word that I seen on one of those daily calendars. Uh, the word was called synesthesis. And I think what it meant was harmony of opposing impulses, which make up a really good project or composition. So I'll continue doing this. And keep refining with the electric eraser around the uh, gum line type area here. And at this point, I have just started with the electric eraser on grinding out the teeth. So if the highlights are really abrasive and too cheesy, if you push too hard, just dust over them lightly a little bit and go in and grind them back out. It's not a sacrilege to layer your highlights. You can also come in with other types of erasers, magic rub, typing erasers. Just kind of blend some of this down. Did a couple things so I put some fresh batteries in the helix here and I also took my exacto knife and just did a flush cut just straight on and I'm trying the best I can to hold this at an angle but I'm getting a really nice abrasive grind just by putting this thing straight on and then wipe it off every now and then so that you will have a fresh surface to grind with. I'm going to come in with a paintbrush now and again I always like to test how much is on my finger before I jeopardize the image here. Real light pressure. Even lighter than that. A 
of a crack in the skull here. And at this point, I'm using the side of the cylindrical shape of the eraser. And when you're highlighting these cracks, some people will just want to put one all the way from beginning to end. And sometimes it's good to maybe do one, skip a little bit of an area, and then start another one right in here, and then taper it around like this. And again, real light pressure. I cannot emphasize that enough, how light the pressure needs to be on this electric eraser. I'm barely even holding this thing here. And that can taper off. And I definitely will dust that down with some gray to subdue that white highlight there. A little bit of gray there. Don't kill it, just calm it down. I think what I'm going to do is move on to the other cracks that are protruding up through this area and out that way there. Too much paint there on the brush. Wipe some of that off. Really stay true to how the crack is flowing as you're crawling up and around here. And as I prefaced these other crack patterns here, it helps me when I come in with the paintbrush. This is what I call the 70-30 rule. I teach this to all my students that not everything's airbrushed. It's 70% airbrushed. But in illustrating and graphics, you want to sneak in all these other things uh, to refine and counterbalance it. So I'll go in and I will dust over these with some more of this charcoal gray. This is probably a good area right now to go in here and start refining the cabbage shape of this area of the skull. Someone once said that all facial parts have the shape of vegetables. If you think about it, it's kind of true. This is a feather stroke. Always go off to the side, don't jeopardize the surface here. And you can see that's giving me a nice little chili bowl type shape there. But again, do not cry on back and forth. I'm also going to come in and preface this little slice of the skull here. I'm going to come in and trap that area. This is a darker area here, so I can actually just kind of get in and out, trap it, and be done. I hope that people are picking up how I'm actually just grabbing whatever I need to trap these little curvy edges and make this thing more believable um, with dimension. I'm going go in here and pop this out. Again, all the dark stuff's at the end. You don't want to kill it in the beginning. And coming around the nose area here, I'm jumping around, so again, I do not overwork any areas. Thank you. 
Notice what I did here when I was highlighting. I came in like this first for a real crisp highlight. And then I turned the electric eraser like this to kind of blend it out. So this is the etiquette hopefully we're getting used to uh, so that we don't make things too pronounced or too cheesy and too stripy, whether it be um, not only a dagger stroke, but a dagger stroke with the electric eraser. This is a cool area, definitely to get in. And you can start to see how I'm building the uh, highlights up by actually starting off and feathering them out. You can actually be pretty random with this and take that electric eraser and go in little circles again straight on like this. In the very end I may come in with some uh, transparent blue to calm all this down or to make it look more mystical but hopefully uh, I've set the uh, tone here with the uh, uh, electric eraser. Um, take your time, very light pressure on it and if you put a good two hours into this um, it's going to be popping off the surface. Again notice what I'm doing, I'm actually crawling along this thing. I went from here down to this way to back. I did not stay in one area for two straight hours because again everything has to match that. So I'm doing what's called piercing at this point. I'm actually coming in here and getting uh, pretty close with these templates, discerning as I go along where the little black edges are, or in this case the charcoal uh, gray edges, and not too much, just very spritzing and hit and miss. Um, of these edges and just jumping around with those little random edges. I think random is a very good word when you're doing this. Definitely want to sneak in this area here, pierce this out and I will finally maybe in the end do one little black piercing uh, but again it's going to be to accentuate some of these other areas that need to be popped out. All these different levels of gray, black, and highlighting uh, is what you need. You've got to constantly keep not only cleaning your airbrush but changing your paint, adjusting your paint uh, to all the little nuances of uh, what you're trying to pull off here. A little bit more free handing over here. Again, it's a good idea to keep your airbrush angled. Now 
notice I'm doing all the dark stuff at the end, not the beginning. Notice how the texture really makes a difference in the drama. That's why I'm a big fan of uh, the illustrating side of airbrushing because t-shirts just did not enable me to get the realism that I wanted to get. I know you can put transparent extender on top of a t-shirt and iron it and take a heat gun and let the uh, paint catch up with the surface and create a resist as you go along. But that's uh, really arduous to me and I'd rather try to um, use all these other techniques which are just easier. It's all about the substrate. I'm going to take some goo gone here and go ahead and spray over the surface here. And because these are acrylics, the goo gone will not cross contaminate the paint or anything. If this was enamel or urethane car paint, I would not be doing this. I'd be using pre cleaner. Then I'm going to take some blue Walmart shop towel. This stuff's awesome, it doesn't leave uh, traces of lint or anything behind. I'm going to keep the surface clean of eraser crumbs, overspray, anything that could leave an annoying layer on this as I keep working in a transparent mode. Give this some heat. And the heat actually evaporates the xylene that's in the Goo Gone, gets rid of all the slipperiness of the Goo Gone. And this will help you maintain a clean, sterile surface. Okay, I'm going to come in with some opaque black now. This is kind of a fun step because I get to come in and really pop this thing out. I know that in the past, I've said do not uh, spray colors right out of the bottle, but this is what I call piercing a color. Um, I think when I mentioned black earlier, uh, what I was talking about was shading, setting this thing up, uh, dusting, um, and establishing all the different tonalities. Uh, what I'm doing with the black out of the bottle is just coming in and randomly really finalizing these little piercing edges. But you got to be careful that you don't overdo it. In the end, this is what the eye is actually going to catch, um, uh, not only from a distance, but it actually pleases the eye to see this much contrast against all this other scratching and everything else that we've been doing. You can see how that really pops that out. We just kind of get in and out, get as close as you want to without oversaturating the paint. You can see how that really pops it out. And zooming out you can see that that creates the realism. So what I'll do now is bounce around these different dark areas and lightly pierce them out. taper this off here. It can start with an edge, but it needs to taper. That way it's not too creasy. And again, I've created the edge. This is the wash right on top of the edge that actually calms this thing down. So I will continue jumping around with this straight black being very hit and miss.
emphasize these little wisping movements here. Making sure that I stay with the uh, continuity and balance of how they're floating or flying. skull fragments. I'm going to use the same dusty gray that I used on the uh, original here. So I'm going to come in. But for right now I just need to kind of make them blend with the other things that are going on in the uh, piece here. So I'll do this and then we will start highlighting and tinting. Okay, I'm going to come in with these teeth. One last bit of dimension here. Shading them at the sides, giving them a wash. Okay, since I'm trying to make this an original piece here, I'm making decisions in my mind if I want the lightning bolt to protrude through the middle part of this eye here so that we can presuppose some type of not only electricity behind the skull um, and the top of the skull, but actually penetrating through the eye socket here and causing all the drama in this area here. I think I'll put just a little bit coming through here. I don't want all the lightning just behind the skull and continue this and give it a light dusting. Continue it. That's probably good enough for that area here. Now the next thing I'm going to do here is make a decision on how much tint or tone I want to put on this. Um, I'm bringing in some deep transparent blue. You can use golden fluid acrylics. You can use Createx. Um, as long as it's a transparent blue, you can uh, come in and miss this. But I always tell my students that when you're tinting something, you want to stay about probably 12 or 13 inches back. So I'm going to bring in my contact paper here. It's kind of like being on Photoshop or something where you can actually preface a tint or tone. And this is the beauty of this material. Um, it enables you to go in, yeah, I'm dusting the blue on now, and kind of preface how much would be too much and how much wouldn't. So I'm like really, really far back when I'm doing this. And that may be enough. I do not want to kill this with blue because I got so much blue going on in the background. Um, let me go ahead and oversaturate it to show you that um, if you get too close, it's over at this point. You might as well just start all over. So this is one thing I can do to preface a tint or a tone. It just saves a lot of time. So let me go ahead and lightly tint this with blue. It's so important to not get carried away with this. The blue is actually going to give it like a mystical type of quality. If you take a piece of Velcro, um, not this part of the Velcro, but the fuzzier part of the Velcro, and you attach it to the end of a Dremel tool like so, and keep this thing straight on, it will allow you to grind the same type of pattern as the electric eraser does but you can get more coverage with it. And if you're doing a huge skull, you could actually slowly take the paint off. It's very, very effective. So again, the electric eraser does pretty good for intricate areas, but this is something that I'm definitely going to start using. So I hope that part helps you. And just give these a little bit of a piercing right there. Kind of gives them a hot point or a flash point. And I can also come in here and do a little bit more wisping and do some little tiny dots. This actually helps this wisping effect. And after coming through the eye here, I think I'll have the lightning climbing up here a little bit. 
so that it looks like it's breaking these fragments up towards the top of the skull. Okay, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Try to have fun with skulls. Skulls are pretty neat to do just based upon the fact that you can really see the shadows well on skulls, the dipping and indented parts. And if you take this type of a concept here and put it against a dark background, um, it really achieves a lot of realism pretty quickly. Um, in this case, the lightning bolt penetrating through the middle brings these opposing elements together. Um, the fragments uh, kept the motion going, um, and it actually keeps the continuity of the piece flowing that way. But try to have fun with this. Again, don't sneak in too much tint, and um, thanks for watching.